I've had two of my friends die from addictions in the past two years. And I lost my sister three years ago. And I have lost four family members and five friends to addiction. We lost him last year in March to a drug overdose. He was a young man who fought his own demons, but yet he had a tender, compassionate heart. This is my son, Derek. And because of addiction and mental health issues, he's currently incarcerated in Spring Hill Penitentiary. It was all about looking good. He didn't want anyone to know that there was anything under, under the surface that was bothering him. He, um, it's all good, Mom. That was his, was his saying in life, that he just wanted, he wanted so badly to feel good, too. It's fun loving and silly and like playing jokes and pranks. And um, it wasn't until he was a young teenager that we noticed changes in his personality, his behavior, his friends that he was hanging around with. And just ended up being surrounded by a lot of negative things, always being at the heart of situations that were going wrong. I started dabbling in drugs and alcohol, uh, smoking pot and uh, having a few beers at the age of 11, 12. My process of addiction began when I was 13 years old. I began using alcohol, which progressed to marijuana, which progressed to cocaine, to IV drug use, which led me down a very dark road that I wanted to die and tried to do that, was unsuccessful. I fell into a crowd at that time that it was, you know, I, I thought I, I found somewhere I belonged, I guess. I lost who I was. I lost track of my life. Lost control over what was important to me. I didn't care who I hurt. When I was 16 years old, I was misdiagnosed ADD and prescribed Ritalin. And it turned into a very serious addiction where I was going through a 30-day prescription of Ritalin in two or three days. As parents, you go through a hard time yourself trying to decide, is this our fault? Did we do something to lead to this? Um, is there anything we could have did that was better to fix it? Could we have helped him sooner? David was my youngest brother, <clears throat> and uh, we, we had a lot of uh, hard times, things that were really bad, and, and at, in the end of it, he, he chose to uh, take a, a, a handful of pills and end his life because of things that were bothering him and, and what life took from him. Addiction has touched my own family, that I've lost two. One, her name is Tabitha, she was four years old. Todd was eight and both of them died in a house fire that was caused through somebody else's addiction. Most recently, I lost a 19-year-old little boy. His name was Davis, who died from a methadone overdose. Um, in none of uh, boys' homes, jails, prisons, um, if committing crimes for, for, for drugs to, uh, to get my next fix. I certainly know now that there's no human more powerful than these substances, no human can save themselves from us. Once you're involved that deep and very quickly for me, it went from where I was in the target group of having fun in high school, like 75% of kids do, into university, way over your head, absolutely need these things to function. I dropped out of high school. I pushed family members away. I stole from family. I just, I let myself go and it took so long, so long for me to find myself again. And it's just, it's a long and it's a scary process. And I know that doing drugs may seem like fun now, but like six months or a year from now when you're sitting on your bed and you can't afford it anymore, all you want is those drugs and you base, you'll do anything to get them. And it's not healthy and you feel like you're dying and you sweat and you, you cry and you just, your life revolves around these drugs and there's so much better out there. You don't need it. When people are addicted to opiates, it kind of, it, it robs something in their body so that after a while, it's no longer about getting high. It's about just taking the pain of withdrawal away. My mom, it hurt my mom. Um, more so than anybody, I think. I've gained so much shame and guilt and remorse and sobered up one day and had absolutely no tools, had to deal with 
any of those feelings. Um, and then you gain good feelings as you recover and you have no, no clue how to deal with any of them. You start to think kind of crazy. You start to think things like, well, maybe we build some kind of a shed in the woods and just chain him up and feed him and keep him for a while till he gets clean. <laughs> but getting him clean didn't fix it anyway. Yeah. Didn't always fix it because when he was clean, he would be depressed a lot as well. I, I, th I think the change came here when, when the level of poverty set in. At one time in Cape Breton, in Glace Bay especially, we used to have street dances. Uh, there was plenty of work. Um, so it created more of a family environment. Of course, with poverty comes, comes all the other aspects of the, the issues we're dealing with today. Um, lack of education, lack of, lack of employment. Um, I think it creates a despair in the people and it seems to be a situation that has actually gotten much worse. And the more we go into poverty and despair, the more people are turning towards drugs and alcohol. Um, it seems to be an escape measure. From my office in the back, we can look out the back door and I can see cars parked there. And when they leave, there's needles all over the place. That is all there seems to be available for them. And they're looking for escape. There's a void. And this void they're filling with any other bad habit they can find. Um, it's a spiritual void. And all I can look at when I see them, I don't see... I see them as young men, but I also see families behind them that are, that are suffering through the same things that we suffered if, if we can't reach them for some, somehow, in some way. We create a shame base around addiction. It's still evident and it's still there today. You know, if we go to an ER, we treat it the same as anybody else. You know, do addicts hide in shame? And most do because they're afraid. And what it does community-wise is people pretend that the problem doesn't exist and if we don't raise them or become involved as all parents and all love and community, then they die. And one addict dying is one too many. To many members of society, I'm identified as a, a thief scum, trouble, criminal, no good, stay away from that guy. To others I'm known as a friend, a colleague, a teammate, a captain, a coach, um, parishioner, paramedic, carpenter. However, in, in all my years addiction and recovery, one of the many things I've learned is that Diseases don't define people. It's a part of who they are. Addictions, who I was, brought me to who I am today in my recovery. There was one stay in, uh, in the county jail um, when everybody walked away from me. My family didn't want anything to do with me anymore. I think more so for themselves. So they were saving themselves rather than, than me, but in turn it ended up saving me. Being sober for two years um, has really taught me a lot about myself. Today, I am a very different person. <laughs> a person that goes smile. You know, just to be comfortable with yourself. And that definitely helped with controlling these urges that I had. I get a chance to, maybe through my story, help others that are going through what I went through my whole life. This is not the end of the road for me. I'm going to keep going because I have a lot of plans. Addiction touches all of us, and the only one I've not treated presently in my career is a Jewish rabbi. Other aspects of other professions I've dealt with. I'm honored and proud to be an addict. I have no regrets from my past because the price I paid through shame and guilt has been enormous, and I've chosen to work in this field to give back to those that I feel part of and that I love. After he passed away, I went to a psychologist for my own health. And the psychologist looked at me and said, Debbie, do you know that five years ago in this province, there were provisions put in place with the healthcare system that deal with mental health and physical health in tandem together. And unfortunately, in the Cape Breton District Health Authority, we haven't implemented these yet. And they could have saved your son's life. And I left that meeting feeling so empty and hurt and thinking something has to change. The food banks are, are 
bursting at the seams as far as having people coming in, needing food, needing services, um, that a sign, that's a sign right there that the poverty here is so dramatic that it, it opens this void. It's a vacuum that's being filled by everything that's bad and negative. And until we can manage to fill that vacuum with something good, it's not going to change. It's not going to stop. And we're only coming back and doing harm reduction techniques with youth, but we have to go further. You know, like the Police and Boys Girls Club, the undercurrent uh, building that exists in Glace Bay, I think is an honor and, and it serves our youth all in Cape Breton, but they can't do it all. I think all communities have to get reinvolved. We have to, it takes a community to raise a child as well. We can't be too busy. I think we get caught up in our jobs and expectations that schools and other people are going to do what we need to do. And it starts with one person doing one thing at a time. You know, the time to save our youth is now. It's too late when they're in addiction. We have to get them before they even get there. We have to teach them self-esteem, self-love, and that comes from group programs and the government reinvesting back into our youth so our society becomes a better society and we're not going to bury any more kids and make other families unhappy.